Hey everyone, this is Zico Callahan with Raptor Chatter, and we're going to be looking at what happened in October 2022 in paleontology. And there were a lot of things that happened, so a lot of these are going to be a bit short as I just try and get through them real quick, but you can always check for the links in the description down below. So at the end of last year, there was a new Ligurpetid found, and it was able to help show that the Ligurpetids and the pterosaurs were really closely related. But this kind of left out Scleromoclus, which was previously have thought to have been the closest other animal we had to the pterosaurs. So this paper actually looked at Scleromoclus, and it's really nice because actually these fossils normally aren't super distinctly preserved. Essentially, you can't prepare out the bones of Scleromoclus because there aren't bones. Instead, the animal would have been buried in sand dunes, the bones would have dissolved, but the spaces where the bones were were still preserved. So these researchers, instead of doing what a lot of previous researchers had done of taking casts of these and putting something like plaster inside of it and pulling out and seeing what it looked like, instead they actually just CT scanned it so they could make high resolution 3D images on a computer of what these bones would have looked like. Unfortunately though, they weren't able to resolve the ankle condition, which is really important for understanding in archosaurs, which means things like crocodilians, but also dinosaurs and pterosaurs. The ankle condition in things like the pterosaurs and dinosaurs is different than the crotarsal type ankle found in crocodilians. And because the ankles on Scleromoclus aren't really that well articulated, it's hard to tell which one of these it had. However, that means they also just found it in three different phylogenetic positions. Essentially, they ran it once with a crotarsan ankle, ran it once with an intermediate ankle, and then ran it once with the ornithodirin ankle, which is the one that, again, goes to pterosaurs and dinosaurs. Even with the more crocodilian-like ankles, though, it still shows up pretty close to pterosaurs. And when using the intermediate and the actual ornithodirin ankles, it shows up really close to Ligurpetids. So it's a really good piece of evidence that actually Scleromoclus is still pretty close to the pterosaurs and important for understanding their evolution. It just might be better for understanding things like the Ligurpetids evolution. And there are other features that do suggest this placement. Specifically, you have things like the shape of the femur, as well as the shape of some of the toes and the feet, and some of the skull bones, especially with the maxilla. So all that really means is that Scleromoclus is still really important for understanding the evolution of pterosaurs and Ligurpetids, and that the common ancestor of those two groups, the Ligurpetids and the pterosaurs, was probably pretty small and running along the ground, rather than being something that was climbing trees. And then eventually, in both those groups, they started to get more into the trees, including entirely flying in the pterosaurs. There was also a new look at some theropod material coming out of the ChemChem -chem group of Morocco. The ChemChem -chem group right now is most famous for having things like Spinosaurus, but there are other theropods that have been found in it as well, most notably Carcardonosaurus, another very large theropod dinosaur that would have been a mega predator on the environment. And there's been some fragmentary pieces of something that was related to Carcardonosaurus that's been thought to potentially be an entirely new genus or just more pieces of Carcardonosaurus. And with this new material, they're actually able to say, no, there are two distinct Carcardontosaurids in the ChemChem -chem group. This one's named Sorinops. And again, it had already been named, but this new material helps to just really confirm that it is distinct from Carcardonosaurus and that in the ChemChem -chem group, there were a lot of predatory dinosaurs and even very large ones. You had things like Spinosaurus, potentially another species of Spinosaurid, two species of Carcardonosaur, and some Abelosaurs. So it would have been a very competitive environment for those predators. The next paper goes a lot further back in the fossil record to some of the first animals on land, and specifically in Diadectes. Diadectes was probably an early amnio meaning it would have laid hard-shelled eggs as opposed to the kind of gooey amphibious eggs you think of in things like, well, amphibians. But that means it was either related to the mammals or to reptiles, and based on current evidence, it was probably closer to the reptiles. And we can actually start looking at some more parts of the skull to try and understand what exactly was happening with this organism and how that influenced the evolution of the later reptiles. Unfortunately though, this paper is mostly just a description of that skull, so it's really just laying down the groundwork for future work to be done, because reptile skulls are weird. You can think about things like turtles, which are entirely toothless, or in crocodilians, where you have a very hard, fixed skull. The bones don't really move around a whole lot relative to one another. 
Meanwhile, in things like lizards and snakes, the bones move around a whole lot relative to one another. So this early animal can hopefully start giving us insights into how reptile skulls evolved later down the line. The Eocene climactic optimum was a period of very intense global warming, and this is largely due to the giant volcanoes that were erupting off the coast of Ireland, Iceland, as Greenland started splitting away from the rest of Europe. But after this, it started to cool down some, and that means a lot of the carnivores that had evolved for that warm climate just didn't do as well. And that's where we start getting our modern order carnivora. And this is basically the mammalian carnivores, very loosely put at least. So you have things like bears and cats and dogs, but also smaller things like civets. So it's a really broad group that covers a lot of different bases for what different organisms, especially in mammals, can actually do when they're hunting. And some of the first ones of these were very cat-like, specifically the Nimravids, which we have a video on the Nimravids. One of the Nimravids I mentioned in that video is Hoplophonius. And this is actually really interesting because there's a new animal coming from California which seems to be closely related to Hoplophonius. Named Pangerban egai, it actually lived about 5 to 10 million years before Hoplophonius, but they were again closely related. And the thing is, Hoplophonius shows a lot of traits that suggest it was a later branching Nimravid. Essentially, if you think of that lineage as a straight line, there's different branches coming off of it. That also means that Pangerban would have been one of the later branching ones, but it shows up so quickly after the Eocene climate optimum that it really helps to show that after the loss of the other carnivores at that time, the first carnivorans, like the Nimravids, not only just evolved really quickly, but diversified really quickly too. And so you would have had those first Nimravids and then a lot of different branches of Nimravids in just a short amount of time. So the evolutionary process went really quickly for them to help fill a lot of those predatory niches. The Nimravids are sometimes called false saber-toothed cats because a lot of them had saber-like teeth, but they weren't actually cats. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't still new cat fossils found, because there was one actually coming from 100 miles off the coast of China on Taiwan. And this fossil is actually fairly recent, within the last few hundreds of thousands of years. And this makes sense. When the ice ages were happening, there was a lot more water in the oceans taken up into those ice caps, meaning that you could actually walk across a land bridge to Taiwan from the mainland. It's been shown to be a member of the genus Homotherium, which was a very common animal at that time. There's fossils of it from parts of Europe, a lot of Asia, North America, and Africa. It was, it was pretty much everywhere. And we don't really know what species of Homotherium it was, but it does make sense it could have gotten there, again, because of this land bridge. The really interesting thing is, though, that we weren't really expecting to find this, because there's not been a lot of paleontological work done on the island of Taiwan, and so it's really good evidence that we actually should be getting out there more to try and find these kinds of things. Because we might be able to find some more isolated environments and potentially even see how some Taiwan-specific animals started to evolve. For example, the Formosan leopard or some of the black bears that are native to just the island. Going way back in time again to the Permian, the Permian is not normally thought of as having a lot of Lagerstadt. And when I say Lagerstadt, that just means that there's really, really good fossil preservation. And a lot of this is because all of the continents were pushed together, so a lot of the basins were pretty homogenous. There weren't the kind of very specific environments where you can get really good preservation, at least not as often. This paper, though, does actually show that there was at least one in South Africa. And it comes from the Karoo Basin, which has a lot of sediments from that time period, especially the middle to late Permian. And this actually helps us understand what exactly was going on in the environment during the Capitanian, which was a part of the very late end of the Middle Permian. Now, there's going to be more work done on this site, but all these authors really present right now is some of the different insects that would have been present, but also a lot of the different plant life that would have been present, which is really interesting because we're able to actually start building this kind of large-scale understanding of what the Karoo Basin would have been like in the Permian. And we often think about the Permian as being very dry, but at least in this part of the Karoo, it would have been pretty wet. And maybe it was seasonal, but at least we could understand that there would have still been a lot of plant life at the edges of this lake where these fossils formed. And this paper is in some ways a great example of why it's really hard to do paleontology, because their sample size is one and they come to some conclusions, which do make sense based off of their sample, 
but again, it's a sample size of one. What they found is that sauropodomorphs probably evolved their long necks that they were famous for pretty slowly and over a longer period of time. And that's because we have some very early sauropodomorphs, about 235 million years old, that had pretty short necks, or at least compared to their body, relatively short necks. Meanwhile, we have some later ones from about 225 million years ago that did already have their long neck. And this new one comes from 228 million years ago, and it's in between these two time periods and it has a kind of intermediate neck. There wasn't still a short neck, which would suggest that suddenly within its time period to the long necked ones, there was a rapid growth of the neck, and it didn't have a long neck, which suggested between the short necked ones and it, there was a rapid growth of the neck. So it really helps to suggest that in sauropodomorphs, neck growth and evolution of the neck length actually went pretty slowly. But again, this is a sample size of one. Maybe it's just this species that actually had a shorter neck compared to other ones, and maybe they did already have long necks. Or maybe it actually did grow a longer neck faster, but the ones that led to the longest necked ones still had short necks at the same time. Again, it's a sample size of one, which makes it really hard to try and actually understand what was happening. But based on what they do have, it does make sense. There's a lot of poorly explored Cretaceous rocks in places like Mississippi, and that's largely because these rocks were used for croplands for plantations instead of being looked at for something other than just financial investment. But now we're starting to get some researchers who are actually looking at these rocks, and they actually found some evidence and some fossils of a large ornithomimid coming from the late Cretaceous. It's important to understand that North America at this time was mostly divided. There's a large seaway cutting the continent in half. So you would have had Laramidia in the west and Appalachia in the east. And these two subcontinents had some different but still similar faunas. And this new ornithomimid helps to show that they are similar. Because it helps to show that there were still very large bodied ornithomimids in Appalachia during the late Cretaceous. We have some evidence of ornithomimids there in the early Cretaceous, such as Arkansasaurus. However, this is really our first strong evidence that they persisted up until later parts of the Cretaceous. On the subject of sample sizes though, sometimes you do get death assemblages which do get you a good sample size, such as the one at Ghost Ranch, where there's just dozens of Coelophysis fossils. The researchers for this paper actually did histiology and cut open some of the bones and tried to see how these animals grew. And they found that there was a lot of variation from individual to individual, suggesting potentially some level of plasticity where under different conditions, they would actually grow at different rates. This would later be lost in most dinosaurs where they would start to grow at more consistent rates. However, this kind of early flexibility may have helped lead to the success of the group as a whole, as similar evidence has been found in other animals, specifically Massospondylus, a sauropodomorph, and again, this just suggests that it may have helped them through tumultuous times, such as the mass extinction event at the end of the Triassic, whereas many other archosaurs, such as the Pseudosuchians, didn't really make it other than our modern crocodilomorphs. It really seems like this kind of variability helped the dinosaurs get through even better than they did. There was also a look at Parksosaurus, coming from the Horseshoe Canyon formation of the late Cretaceous in Canada. The paper found it was a Theskelosaurine dinosaur, which were a group of small to potentially medium-sized ornithopod dinosaurs. And some of them actually have evidence of burrowing, such as Orodromius. It's actually really interesting to actually find one though this late in the Cretaceous, because we didn't really expect to have that many of these later in the Cretaceous, because in general, we see a lot more homogenization of some of these environments. And while there's a lot of diversity, the numbers seem to be doing fine in some specific environments, especially in North America. So finding one of these just adds to that diversity and suggests, hey, maybe there was more diversity and we're just not actually finding it in the fossil record just yet. And on the subject of the Theskelosaurines, there was an entirely new one described, this one coming from Nevada though. And in fact, it's Nevada's first dinosaur. It's been named Nevadadromius schmidi. And it's really interesting to find it, in part because, in general, again, we don't find dinosaur fossils in Nevada, and a large part of that is because Nevada was pretty inland during this time period. I already mentioned that there was an inland sea at this time during the Cretaceous in North America, and most of the fossils we have come from closer to that sea, where you would have had 
more meandering deltaic systems and river systems starting to actually lay down sediment to bury fossils in. So finding something from this far inland is actually really exciting and hopefully will lead to future discoveries. The Jenkins event is essentially what ended the early Jurassic. When we're considering these different time periods, we really look for changes in what is happening in the oceans and in faunas. And it's a period of climatic change where there is one of these kind of transitions in the fauna of the ocean. But how did it affect life on land? That's what this paper looked at specifically with dinosaurs. The main thing that this paper tried to do is understand how it most importantly would have impacted diversification of dinosaurs. And they found that across multiple groups, yeah, there was a big change after this event. Because you have a few early groups of dinosaurs that persist through the early Jurassic. And then a lot of those die out, but after the event, you start seeing the diversification of different clades, including, for theropods at least, megalosauroids and allosauroids, and things like the tyrannosauroids. There's a sudden burst in diversity that occurs after the Jenkins event. And the same thing holds true in things like the ornithopods, and also the sauropods. So it seems like this specific climatic event really allowed the diversification of dinosaurs to really take off. So they could go into all the different kinds of forms that we actually know them from later in the Mesozoic. And so then we have another pretty neat paper, except again, this one is laying groundwork for future research. Because it used intelligent sampling to try and understand what the articulation of different muscles and joints would have been. And they did this with a lot of living specimens, essentially doing dissections, seeing where the muscles would interact, seeing how far the joints could move. And then building that into a database that could be used algorithmically to try and estimate the amount of motion that different animals would have had in the fossil record. And they tested this using the shoulder of Dimetrodon. And that's largely because Dimetrodon's shoulder has had a lot of debate about how it was used. In some cases, they suggest it was more sprawling, like a lizard. And in other cases, it's been suggested it could do more of a high walk. And they come at least to some interesting conclusions based on this, mostly suggesting that it doesn't really move like anything that's around today, in part because it would be able to pronate its limbs as it was walking. So that means it would essentially be able to rotate this first part of its arm and the upper part of the arm in order to get a different kind of motion and stroke when it was walking. And then the retraction stroke would be not just the reverse of that, but a different kind of motion. Unfortunately, there's not really any animations or even images of these motions in the paper that I saw, which is unfortunate because I really want to understand it better. They might be in supplementary data, but I found this one about 30 minutes before recording, so tossed it in there real quick. And finally, we have a paper that I did an entire separate video on, and it is the making of a dinosaur mummy. Dakota was a dinosaur mummy that was found in South Dakota, makes sense with the name, and a lot of this research was just going into how did this happen? How did it get preserved? The researchers found that there was basically a three-step process. First, it died and got scavenged on, which makes sense, it's gonna die. And those holes that were opened by the scavengers allowed insects to come in and lay eggs inside of it. Those would then eat the flesh of the underlying part of the muscle, but importantly, not the skin. So the skin would deflate onto the bones. Then it gradually got buried and was able to dry out the skin so it could still be preserved, but not entirely fall apart. And then as it got buried, the rest of the fossilization process happened. And then finally, it just kind of popped out of the surface so people could actually look at it and dig it up. And when we consider that there's actually a lot of mummies coming from things like the Hell Creek Formation, this makes a lot of sense, because it means there's not as specific of conditions needed for this fossilization process. Instead, it's a few different conditions, sure, but not things that are as rare, meaning that the number of dinosaur mummies we do have starts making a lot more sense. And so hopefully we'll be able to better understand these processes in the future. And also now that we have a pretty well-preserved fossil of an Edmontosaurus with skin, we can start to understand more about its biology. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, there weren't a ton of papers out right now, but because SVP was going on, that means there will be a whole lot in the future and some of them sound pretty interesting. Unfortunately, since those aren't peer reviewed, I really am not gonna be discussing many of them. Also because I did not go to Toronto for SVP this year. That being said, we might be trying to do a little bit, uh, quite a few more one-shot videos this month, so keep your eyes out for that. With all that in mind, be safe, take care, don't go extinct.